Hello and welcome along to the Andrew Eborn Show with me, Andrew Eborn, and not one, but two incredibly special guests. A regular on the show, Dawn Parry, and also for the first time, probably the first time ever on this channel, but not the last, the wonderful Debbie Arnold. How are you doing both? Hello. <laughs> good well, morning, Andrew. <laughs> and good morning, Debbie, and good morning, Debbie's dogs as well. It's all right. This is what I love about it. We work on that sort of basis where you, get, you have all these wild animals. Dawn always has these glorious things. Pavarotti. Where's Pavarotti today? Pavarotti is enclosed. There's avian flu around, I'm afraid. So Pavarotti's got to be enclosed in his courtyard. Well, but he's cock-a-doodle doing out there. <laughs> but, you know, these animals, these animals are all sent to try us, Andrew. That's the thing. You know, they, they, they don't understand that we're here filming, that we're desperately trying to get things out on the air. I think, I think they do. Come here. Come on, let's have a look at your dog. What's, oh, fantastic. What's your dog called, Debbie? Oh, well, I've got four. <laughs> the only one's a boy, though, isn't he? Uh, uh, Bear, come here. Come and, come and see. Bear, Bear, Bear. Yeah, let's have a look at that. How are, oh, oh, there you go. Look, that's like a magic trick. You all of a sudden changed your black Labrador into, into a golden one. Fantastic. Yes, that's that's the other one. And then oh. I've got I've got three of the two black, one golden, and a chihuahua. Oh, oh, like, how does the chihuahua feel? Must be. I mean, something we celebrate difference, but they're all huge. The other dogs. Can you imagine the chihuahua? She rules the roost, darling. Yeah. It tends to be that sort of Napoleon concept, doesn't it? You know, I, we, I grew up with loads of dogs. We had everything from a Great Dane to a, to a tiny little Jack Russell. And uh, it was always the little ones, which were very grumpy. <laughs> no, she's fabulous, actually, but she just tells them what to do. You don't do that, they don't do it. They're terrible. I know, I, I know, but there's something also, they live a lot longer as well, the small ones, for some reason. I think their heart is tiny, so it doesn't have to work as much. Oh, little tiny heart. My, my heart. <laughs> and talking about tiny hearts and the nation's love, I always used to say that um, 30 years in the business, but actually you've done 40. I let you add the extra 10. Uh, yeah. But you have, unlike anybody else, you've been in more soap operas than any other actor, actress that I know. Uh, what's the secret to your success? Well, I think, I think with the soaps, you know, they've been going, I mean, my, my very first soap was Coronation Street, which I went into in the early 80s. Uh, and it was a dream. I wrote to Bill Podmore, the producer. I wrote to him and I used to send him poems. And I'm sure the only reason he got me in for an interview was to shut me up. And it, eventually I got in and I, and I got the part. But my first ever line in Coronation Street was to, uh, to Mike Baldwin. <laughs> and I said, you know, what I had to say to him was, do you know what you are? you're as slippery as a wet welly. And I thought, God, if I say wet willy, my whole career is over. <laughs> <laughs> what did you say? So what did uh, you say, Debbie? I know I said wet welly, of course I said it. Oh, right. you did? <laughs> <laughs> but, but, um, I was it. At the, the industry you were Sorry. touching on earlier, the industry is very, very different these days because you also, in that stage just beforehand, were doing a Now Who Do You Do? So following on your father's footsteps as, as an impressionist. Mm -hmm. uh, and you were telling me before about Freddie Starr. Tell me about that first experience. Well, the thing is, I, I started as in, in Who Do You Do? Because that was, a, I suppose, a way to get in. And then I wanted to start doing dramas and stuff like that. And that's when I got into Coronation Street. I didn't go in straight away. It was like four or five years later. But my very first job was in Who Do You Do? And, and Freddie Starr was in the... the in the first show uh, that I did. And he came up to me and he said, hold this for good luck. And I didn't have my contact lenses in. And by the time I got my glasses on to see what he was holding, well, you can imagine what it was. Now, everyone thought it was hilarious. The business is very different th today than it was then, because if that would have happened to my daughters, he would have been sacked immediately. But then everyone thought it was hilarious. And you know what? I had to get on with it. You know, I was a kid, I was 17 years old. It was, a, it was a, I told my mother, who was an agent in the business, she thought it was funny too. But the thing is, we know how to deal with these things as women. Nowadays, it's completely different. These things don't happen. But in those days, those things happened. Oh, absolutely. And they used to embrace that sexuality. I mean, Ronnie Barker wrote a special character for you, Voluptua, didn't he? Voluptua, good Vol body. Thank you. Yes, Voluptua, good body. <laughs> so, and especially the two <laughs> Ronnies. So, so how did you feel? Because that was sort of celebrate. But there's two sides of it. One is celebrating the feminine form and, and the, the days of Benny Hill. And, and, and basically, I think for Ronnie, you encapsulated everything, everything that he loved about the woman. Is that That's right? what he said. He said, said you're, you're my perfect fantasy so you've got it exactly but it was not salacious 
and I wouldn't do the Benny Hill shows because I thought they were salacious. And I was asked a load of times because my my dad worked with Benny and he was a friend of his, but I wouldn't do the shows because I felt, and I think Dawn, you'll agree with me here, the Benny Hill shows to me were very gynecological. Yeah, they were. They were. (laughs) Definitely. (laughs) I've never heard, I mean, very very posh word for Benny Hill, but it's, uh, but why do you think they were so gynecological? The cameras, Andrew, were always in a strategic position up your backside and uh, it, it was horrible and I didn't want to do that and I'm worth I was worth I thought no I'm not do that and then I went to work at the National Theatre so I was even though I was the sort of the the blonde I was still the blonde who was a serious actress as opposed to being the blonde that was the just on the bennies and the girls that did the bennies were fabulous I mean and actually kind of hit me you know came back and sort of bit me in the bum uh, excuse the pun, in the end, because they all made loads and loads of money for the repeats when the Bennies went to America. And uh, I never did them. <laughs> I mean, selling internationally, it, it did. It worked on that sort of basis because there was no real dialogue. It was all, as you say, kind of ecological all the way through. But well, international it, sales went crazy. Yes, it, it, it was all it was all boobs and bums, wasn't it? And it was all running yeah. around the screen. You know, and that was the whole... Uh, you know, you look back and actually, I, I tell you what's quite interesting. I've shown my sons um, and my younger son especially is really shocked at what people used to laugh at, what people used to, you know, call humour. Mum, where's the comedy in this? There was Love Thy Neighbour as well. Wow. You know, a shocking programme really by today's standards. Absolutely and, shocking. Absolutely. And my, my, and language my younger son was horrified. Yeah, my all of those programs from the 70s when you had people like Bernard Manning on, on, on the television all the time, that sort of racism, homophobic, prejudice, sexist stuff uh, has been completely wiped out. Do you think we've gone too far the other way now, though? Yeah, I do, because I still think there's a lot of uh, um, we, we, we can we can be a lot less woke if, you know, it is possible. Oh, obviously, all the, all the terrible stuff has been ironed out, which is really, really good. And I'm glad about that. But I think being as, as a woman, you you learn to be very, very strong. I mean, I used to do loads and loads of sitcoms in the in the early 80s and the 90s. And um, in, in this, when you used to do a live sitcom with, with a live television audience, it, to me, it was one of my the best mediums because you had the audience and you had the TV at the same time. And they used to line the shots up when you used to go there in the morning for the, when you used to do the show. They used to line the shots up. Then we're probably about eight or nine, it was multi-cameras. And I used to look up at the, at the wall of television screens in the studio and every single one of those cameras was on my boobs. Mm. Now, you know, and it was just that like- That wouldn't happen. Yeah. No. Today, that just wouldn't happen. It's it interesting, happen. though, you know, you, you talk about uh, live television uh, going out there, but with an audience. And I think there's only really one actual sort of show that does that now, Mr. Brown's Boys. Um, yeah. Oh, Mrs. Brown, sorry. <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Brown's Boys is <laughs> the equation right, actually. You've got to balance yeah. it. But, you know, and, and again, going back to Woke, um, I'm co-writing a book at the moment that is very non-woke. In fact, um, you know, it's it's been a problem uh, with regard to getting publishers involved um, because it's so non-woke. Because we don't, it's, it's you know, uh, I've been told it's non-PC currently. It's uh, How to Meet a Man. We were chatting about this yesterday, Debbie, weren't yeah. we? Yeah. Um, how to Meet a Man. And people have said, but that's not very PC. You should include gay women you should include gay men you should include everybody and I'm like well actually you know the last time I looked the majority of us are still straight and I don't know about gay people's lives so I can only write about what I know about and what I want to put out there so we're we're doing it anyway. (laughs) And I think that's right. If If you want to meet if you want to meet a man yeah then you want to meet a man if I want to meet a woman I might want to meet a woman I think that I think it's fair enough don't you? I I think that's right and as long as you're not excluding anybody and that's the whole thing prejudice well we can get to the stage where it's irrelevant what colour what sex what religion uh, what what political beliefs that you have and you just look at the person whatever they want you can let them have within the law obviously but you make that make sense and hopefully we'll get to the other stage because I think sometimes you're right we're balancing it too far so poor Dawn with her great book and it's a great title having problems now getting stuff out is the wrong way of doing things isn't it 
It is, but you, but unless you actually uh, tick all the boxes, and you've got to remember as well that an awful lot of these people who first get to read these things are actually very young, and those are the gatekeepers, and they're not understanding that, you know, there's a market out there for women over the age of 45 who really want to fall in love all over again, and love, love doesn't stop just because you get older. Somebody that you fancy, you know, they're still out there, no matter what age you are, and if somebody puts a spring in your step, you know, you have to go with it, don't you? I think, I think what I think is very interesting, I want to ask you this, Andrew, as, as a bloke here, okay? Um, when I, I feel that now I'm at a certain age, but my head and my who I am inside is also a different age to my physical age. So therefore I stopped growing, I would say probably feeling the same from about 30-ish. So I'm kind of the same woman. So therefore I'm only attracted to men who think the same way. Now, some people get, so it's not about physicality. It's not about how old he looks. He could look 117 if he was still the same age up here. <laughs> but the problem is people look in the mirror and become, they act, they, they're, they're at their age. Now, I don't know if men feel the same way, but I, I want to meet a man who is the same age as me here not the same not older yeah. and not younger i, I need him to have the same right, energy no you're absolutely right and the most attractive feature and it sounds like a naff answer but it's actually true the most attractive feature is somebody's personality you can be attracted to them because of the physical thing in the first place um but i started life as as a lawyer and the thing about a lawyers is you have to you're advising people when you're first starting who are maybe one generation two generations older than you and you have to basically um it's irrelevant how old you are and, and yeah. one thing i remember as a child is people used to always used to say to me oh i wish i did that when i was your age and i always felt well why on earth didn't you you know just go out and do things don't be full of life uh with regrets because you're right it's never too late to fall in love. I, I think it's never too late and there's lots of initiatives and I, I see we, we have a few of the similar sort of initiatives um, uh, which we've come on to. But there's encouraging people, greys matter. I like, I like that as a principle. Just because somebody's got experience, we shouldn't say that's enough, let's move on to the next generation. I think we should yeah. embrace that. Um, but interesting. But, but going, but, yeah. Sorry, just going back a second to what Debbie was saying though about relationships with people. So if she's, you know, looking for a man, then the, the, the point is, I think that women, we are bowled over about, uh, bowled over with um, men's kind of, you know, forget the physical stuff and all the rest of it. That, that can be initially quite enticing or not. <laughs> it can be the complete reverse as well. But when you get to know men uh, and uh, or a man and his personality or his intellect is just so entertaining and exciting you can't help but be quite bedazzled um uh, and somebody else might think they're boring but if they're particularly bright and they tickle you're going back to gray matter not grays but gray matter um it's then exciting and interesting and you can't help but fall in love Oh, no, I, exactly. I, I, well, and I'm talking about falling in love. I mean, what, what I love about uh, Debbie's career is you have done everything from the, the lighthearted comedy moments to the very serious theatre, including Haymarket with Omar Sharif. How was that? Well, like, we actually were, we, we went all over the world with it. So uh, in the UK, uh, we travelled with it. Uh, we started off at Chichester Festival Theatre. Yeah, my, I mean, it was, it was to me. I, I love it. It's a great festival. It, yeah. Theater. That's where we started. So, um, yeah, oh, it was, you know, it was life changing. It was, it was that job that you get. Uh, they auditioned 900 girls and I got it. Um, and to work with the massive superstar that he was uh, is, and all the people that came to see us because they were all friends of his. Um, and then we were supposed to be doing it in New York and Rex Harrison was supposed to be taking over. Can you believe that? Uh, but as it happened, that never happened uh, for lots of different reasons. But it took me to the States. It took me to California. And I did a pilot for a comedy series over there. So the whole show had a huge impact on, on my career. And then that's why Ronnie Barker, Ronnie Barker wrote uh, The Luxury of Good Body uh, because he saw me in the show. And the letter that he wrote me, which I still have, is that I've just seen you in The Sleeping Prince and I hope you won't be offended, but I've written this part especially for you because you are so gorgeous. But isn't that lovely? And, uh, but it's celebrating both though, isn't it? Because you've got that juxtaposition of the sort of intellectual and you, you've got the satisfaction of appearing in front of theatre audiences and you've performed in some of the best theatre in the world. But you've also then, you can do that lighthearted comedy stuff and but moving on from the sexist stuff, can't you? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Debbie. I mean, I think, sorry, darling, yeah. 
I was just going to say, I was going to, I was going to move it away from there because I know that you're also on a schedule this morning. So um, I would very much like to ask you something that I know is very, very close to your heart. And that was the commemoration last week. You've got a fabulous story yourself. Well, it's, it's awful. It's horrendous. But I mean, it's a, it's a really, really moving story um, with regard to your grandparents, your mother's parents, yeah. um, the commemoration of um, the Holocaust that, uh, you know, has been going on. I wonder if you'd like to tell us about that. Well, the kinder transport, my mum came on the kinder transport. She came on the very last train of the kinder transport in 1939 from Vienna when she was three years old. And interestingly enough, uh, I mean, or perhaps I should tell you this afterwards, but she was put on the train by her parents, so she never met them. To put a three-year-old child, I don't know, Andrew, if you're a parent, I know that you are, Dawn, but yeah. to put a little girl on the train by herself um, was terrible. And in fact, the, and, the, the, and then she came to England, but the, the train that went after them, they, they actually got them off. They never went. They ended up taking them to Auschwitz instead. So she got on the very last train. She was very lucky. And she, she literally came here by herself. She was a stateless child. Her state was stamped on her passport. She was brought up by a family in London. <clears throat> she never knew that she was Jewish. She didn't know what happened to her parents. She had no idea. She couldn't speak English when she arrived. And this her, little her girl... Parents, her parents were, were actually murdered in Auschwitz. Her parents were murdered they? in Auschwitz. They, went to, they were murdered in Auschwitz. Um, and then she came and at, at 11 years old, she found out that she was Jewish. She went to the, uh, the Beacon in Tunbridge Wells. And then she found, uh, and then her brother found her. She, and he said that he'd found her father. He came to England he, he, through the Red Cross. He said that he'd found her father in Auschwitz. And his father, her father said, please find your sister. And my mother said, well, I didn't realize that I had a brother. And he said, yes. He said, well, our father was an artist. And she went, oh, how wonderful. And he said, no, he wasn't an artist. He was a comedian. So her father was a comedian. And her, uh, in the Yiddish theatre, and her brother became a comedian, and then she married my father, who was also a comedian. But the 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 weird thing about this is she went from a stateless child to become Miss United Kingdom. It's remarkable, absolutely remarkable, absolute yeah. sort of true inner strength as well. There, you know, you've got to draw on so much when you when you don't even when you don't grow up in a normal situation and so on. There's so much to to try to fill in. I'm guessing. Yeah, she's, and she was fantastic. She was hilarious as well, incredible humor. So, so my mother's father was a comedian. My mother's brother was a comedian. My father was an impressionist. Um, I'm an all in the so DNA, Debbie. It's actresses. all I'm DNA. Actresses. <laughs> well, I, I, yeah. Well, but and it is interesting because they always say about comedy that so, often it's the comedy and tragedy that go together. And you find that a lot of people are actually very twisted inside. The comedians normally come from a position of adversity. Do you think uh, there is something about adversity that brings out the creative side in people? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Some comedians are very, very depressive and some aren't. You know, like Eric Morgan wasn't, for example. You know, he, he was great. You know, he was just as he was. I mean, Tommy Cooper was a complete and utter lunatic. I mean, he was insane, totally insane. These are all these, and the other thing is about my dad as well, which is something that not many people know. So when my father was diagnosed, because he was very, very he, got big, he was a very big star very early on. He was, he was booked to play, um, he played the Palladium three times in three months and broke all records by the time he was 25. And he was booked, he was taken on by, um, a, oh God, Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis's agent. And he was about to open the Pink Flamingo in Las Vegas right. with Ethel Merman. He was gonna be, and so that was his career. It was, he, was, he was gone to America. And just before he went, he started having fits and they didn't know what he was. And then they put him into a, a, a mental hospital because they thought he was having a breakdown and they gave him electric shock treatment and everything. And then they found out that he had a brain tumor. Oh, and by the, time, by the time he was 27, he was unable to work, unable to speak. He lost all movement. It was, it was terrible. So my mom was left having you know, lost her parents, uh, having married a man, and then she was left with a baby and a very, very sick man. And all of those people, Eric and Ernie, um, Des O'Connor, Bob Monkhouse, um, Frankie Vaughan, all of my father's friends sent my mother money to help her. Right. Wow. And they were, they were penny, they were just, you know, they were just variety artists then. And they didn't have very much money themselves. Um, and, um, and, that, and that's how, you know, and then he died and, and they, you know, they kind of kept her going, but then she became a top agent because she was asked to book a club in the Northeast and she said, look, I'm gonna, I can get my mates through, I can get Eddie's friends. And they, they all came to work for her and she had the biggest stars working for her because of my dad. 
So I, it kind of, it's an amazing story. Yeah, I, 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 I had. It's, it's taking that sort of adversity, isn't it? And looking about sort of reinventing yourself, if you like. I mean, you, you talk about that in, in your book, The Power of Reinvention, which is that sort of recipe, if you like, your ABC of success. Um, what do you think those elements should be then? When people in the current climate, they're obviously suffering. There are a lot of people at home, they, they don't have any outlooks. Um, they enjoy watching Wonder Birds, which is fantastic. Uh, that's their wonderful uh, little means of escape. What what advice would you give people looking at home about the power of reinvention? Well, I think, I think the thing is, what happened on the eve of lockdown in March last year, I, I had a Zoom call just like this with Sherry and Harriet and Dee Anderson. And we just said, and it was so funny. And I said, you know what, we should just get, how do we get this out there? And, you know, seven million viewers later and 150 shows later, uh, we did. And it's, it's been very, very successful and it's, and it's brilliant. And everyone's so lovely to work. We've had all of our friends on, as you've seen. And so that was taking something where everyone's gone, oh, we're not working, to us working more harder than we've ever worked, producing a show, getting a show together. So I think the thing is, this has now given people a hell of a lot of opportunity they didn't have before. So as opposed to looking for themselves to think, oh my God, this is terrible. You've got to look upon this as an opportunity. There is always diversity. In a, there's always an opportunity out there. There's always something you've always wanted to do. So do it. Yeah. Great Indeed. Advice. And unless... And, and unless people do change their business models, they won't survive right now, whether it's in television, whether it's uh, your, your retail outlets, anything like that, unless they actually alter the way that they do their businesses now, um, I don't think they will survive because I think people's habits have changed enormously. And how fabulous that we can go online and watch what we want to watch now and enjoy, for example, Wonder, Words, Wonder Birds, enjoy four women uh, on our screens, all having a, a bit of fun together talking about everything there's nothing that I mean there are no holes barred are there on your show Debbie no but also it's not it's not unkind either it, it's no. it's it's very kind everybody's very kind and everybody says they can come on and go Do you know what? I really don't feel very good today mm. um uh, or, or or I'm sad about this or you know someone you know Sherry's going to have the vaccine on Wednesday and everybody's going yeah great you know tell us how it feels so it it's it, it, it it's, it's it, we are very lucky to have that connection and a lot of people don't and I think that the zoom thing is, is brought you know you can talk to anybody anywhere in the world I mean and have a conversation like this and it it's fabulous you can do I was watching I don't know if you've ever seen a, a series called this is us have yeah. you seen it yes brilliant. yes it's great it's, it's brilliant but but last night I was watching so obviously what all when it was being filmed in the pandemic and I suddenly noticed that a lot of the scenes, they were either on the, in the car talking to each other when they were both driving, which would, they'd never have a scene done like that before. But suddenly, because of social distancing, all these scenes are being done differently. And I thought, how clever is this? On a video call, in the car, everything is separate. And I thought, you see- that they done by the police video. for that now. Yeah, but, but yeah. Not. they weren't on a video call in the car. <laughs> they were, you know, they were talking to each other. And you just had the shot of him at home, him at home, and then life going on in his house and life. And I thought, gosh, it's so interesting that everybody's had to work differently. We've all had to come out, like this show as well, Andrew. Mm -hmm. How many have you done of these? Uh, over a thousand, can you believe? I've done over a thousand interviews. In and, and how long? Uh, since March, so March the 23rd, because I'm doing the first one, I would normally be on the road. I have, um, I have a business with RJ Gibb, the son of Robin Gibb. We were planning all sorts of tours. We were doing all sorts of television shows. Go out every night as you often go out every night. Um, we were also doing lots of, uh, lots of live events to do also with mental health, which is, I know a big yeah. thing that you're going to do. Um, I, I founded this thing called Canned Laughter, It's Okay Not To Be Okay, which was encouraging people, lots of people in the profession, to come together and talk about their mental illness. Uh, so we can be the generation that talks about mental illness so that the next generation doesn't suffer the stigma. And we were doing lots of live events and everything else. And basically what we did is bring it online. And we're now yeah. communicating with people in a, in a very sort of different way. So and that's and what I love about this as well, you've got access to everybody. So we've had Charles Spencer on to Vivian Westwood to to all sorts of wonderful people and lots of artists in between who are all shut down in their living room and be re basically reinventing themselves. So Toya, who's a great friend, um, does this wonderful thing with her husband, Robert Fripp, uh, icon in, in, in the business as well. And every Sunday they do a Sunday lunch, which is really quirky. You'd never see Robert doing this normally, but they basically reinvented themselves for this audience for the Zoom world. And I think yeah. that's really, really and, interesting. And, and we ought to say as well, Toya's actually got 
a, a chart hit racing up the charts right now, which is uh, You're Invincible. It, it is an amazing song. Invincible. Great sound, and you can tell it's Toya, and it, sounds, it feels and well, sounds so would 80s. You, would you, I'm going to be very cheeky and ask you online, would you ask Toya if she'd like to come on to our show? Oh, of course, I'd be delighted. Yes. Of course, you'd love to, because your, your show is great, and you've had some fantastic guests as well, haven't you? I mean, yeah, we, we have. We have. I mean, last week we had Jonathan Pye, yeah. uh, the actor that plays Jonathan Pye. Here we go. Hang on, no barking. <laughs> no, no barking. That's what you said to Jonathan Pye, isn't it? Yes. No, my, so Tom, Tom Walker, who is a great friend of mine, uh, who play, uh, yeah, in fact, I did a play with him 15 years ago, and he invented Jonathan Pye, and he is the biggest star of the internet, as you know. No, I mean, one of his videos has been viewed around, I think, 110 million times. Yeah. Isn't it? Have, you, have, you, have you watched him? I, I have seen some of it, absolutely. I, I love a Jonathan, but absolutely brilliant. And that sort of stuff is fantastic. So what we will do, we will absolutely trade guests. I think that's a right. good idea. I'll, 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 give, I'll give Tom your details and see if he'd like to come onto your show. Because he's a re And his career has been really, really interesting. And, and I think, you know, the, the more that we can do that. So yes, we can all trade. You see what I mean? This is about collaboration. Well, maybe and that's what I love. Fake crashes on the shows, we'll get everybody on. We can have like uh, celebrity squares. Where we'll have, I mean, how many of us would there be? Uh, lots on the same show would be fantastic and, and, all, and also I shall, I shall introduce you to tony McHale. so tony McHale is the actual person who actually started eastenders he's the, one of the original writers and silent witness and loads and loads of shows and he actually created holby city oh, i love it we're going to do all of that more animals this is what we love as well and yeah, i'm sorry never apologize <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> He's saying, Sorry. he's saying like, cats should come on this show. I agree with you. You're the first cat I've seen. Ah, well, wow. He's, he's a bit wild. Well, he's a Bengal. They do go a bit crazy. Oh, God, here we go. Woo. <laughs> <laughs> That, well, the, the, other, everywhere. the other thing we share as well, Debbie, are, are some of your charities. So I know you're an ambassador uh, uh, campaigning against bullying um, on, yeah. on that sort of side, uh, similar sort of mental health things. And, and people talking about these issues. I, I had uh, um, lots of people come on the show who talk about how they've been bullied as kids and so on and so forth, and the devastating effect it has for years afterwards. And if we can just talk about it, get people to talk about it, they can be inspirational for those who are sitting at home suffering, but also hope the bullies who tend to have been uh, coming from a history of bullying themselves will get to realize the effects that they are having on people. And if we can do something to stop that, that's gotta be good, hasn't it? Yeah. Absolutely. Well, I am ambassador of the National Bullying Helpline, and uh, it's fantastic. At one point during lockdown, I think they had something like 57,000 calls an hour. Shocking. As I you mean, know, I'm a, I'm a counsellor, um, in a political counsellor, and, um, and we've had so many situations where, you know, there are children in the most horrendous situations, and they haven't been able to be helped over this period um, in the same way that we would normally be able to, to help them with officers and so on. Sorry, yeah. Debbie, carry on. Yeah. No, 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 absolutely. But uh, my favourite charity, of course, is the uh, I'm the ambassador for the uh, the retired police dogs fund, and and so that's that's fun. And I've been down there. I've watched them being trained, and they're not just the they're not German shepherds. They're they're all the drugs dogs and all of those lot, and they they're just amazing, absolutely amazing. They are incredible. And those that, working dogs. A friend of mine runs a company called Wagtail, and they do all these dogs, which are like sniffer dogs, and they work on that sort of stuff. But they can find lost people, and they can find bats and so on and so forth. Dogs are incredibly helpful and incredibly intelligent. And you're right, once they've finished and they're retired, um, it's great to have that charity. And the other charity- Well, the, you know, the problem, the, the reason the charity has started is that they can't get these dogs insured afterwards. Right. And, and uh, which is, maybe, which, maybe which is ridiculous. Yeah. yeah, because the police pay for their insurance when they're with them. Right. The minute they retire them, and they're only eight, and some of them live to a lot longer. But they've had, they have quite a lot of issues. First of all, they have quite a few mental health issues because they've been going to work every day and now they're not. It's like, Oh, what do we do now? So they have to keep them stimulated. They also have, they like these dogs to pull because that's their job. They have to pull you in order to find things. So therefore they suffer from shoulder issues and, you know, ligament issues. So, uh, and they can't get them insured. So we, we hopefully can pay for their treatment. Well, it's great charity. Buses for the homeless as well. I was at the launch of that and uh, it was it's very celebrity friends. I think you might've been there as well. We all had a little bus on, on, on the south of, uh, um, and it, yep. the Trafalgar Square, so great charity on that sort of stuff. Um, but you're also, in, a, in addition to all of that, uh, and this is sort of confusing, you're, you're the, you've are you got your beauty range that you do, the face of Etam, I think it is, isn't it? Which I is, was, we, yeah, I was with Michelle Collins. We were the, that was the face of Etam, the face of Goldwell. I've kind of been around forever, haven't I, really? 
it's really really wonderful and, and we haven't touched on uh, the two marriages um I know, which you had as well one to my good chum john chalice uh which you had for a little while and and david jansen and, and it's rather like yeah, well, that. That is, i absolutely adore john chalice i mean that he is one of the funniest most mm. wonderful people i adore good him. old boy so what a nice thing to say about your ex-husband eh Oh, it's lovely. It's Indeed. lovely. And, and talk about mishearing things. When you talk about David Jansen, you assume that people are working through the whole course of Only Fools and Horses, but of course it's not David Jason, it's David Jansen. Um, yeah. And David, that's the stuff. It's rather like having, yeah. instead of the face of uh, Etam, you can have the face of Edam, and there could be all sorts, yeah. of, all, all sorts of mistakes there. But in terms of tips then, and finally to finish on a positive note, and we will, as I say, compare notes. People sitting at the home at the moment and still suffering statistics are depressing every time you switch the news on it is all doom and gloom what message would you give to people uh struggling at home at the moment is that we, we're all in the same boat uh, and i have to every time i get really really upset i go back to my grandparents and think that they they had no idea what was going to happen next um and if they were given the option of staying inside and just being at home for two years i think they would have handled that um, and I think we've got to realise that, you know, even though it's very hard for our mental health not to mix with other people, we're actually being protected as opposed to being out there with the elements. Uh, and so therefore we can do creative things. We've just got to get our heads and try and watch as much light entertainment as possible, read as many light books. And actually, the other thing that really does help is to listen to music of your era, like, like of the 70s, and put on, you know, Earth, Wind and Fire and dance around the kitchen, because all of that brings you back to who you were to your uh, happy time in life Try, it, it's all about reconnecting yourself you know it's just it's just as easy to, to wake up and say I'm going to be depressed today as or, or it is again actually I'm not going to allow myself even though it's not that easy to, to snap yourself out of mental health and I'm not diminishing mental health because it's, it's really important but on the other hand you can say to yourself I am going to do something today just even for one hour that makes me feel good and then it all will happen I think Debbie's absolutely spot on with that. It is really, really important. Music's actually been shown as well, not just to make people feel happier, but it's also known to reduce your stress levels. It's known to reduce your um, high blood pressure if you've got high blood pressure. And there is something quite magical about um, putting things on that you remember the words to from donkeys years ago, and you don't even you don't even realise that you remember the melodies and the words, or maybe the harmonies or whatever, but they do ignite. A, a kind of um, a feeling, a warm, fuzzy feeling. And if you can get that from whether it is music or whether it's a piece of cake and a cup of tea or whatever it is, I think it's really important to do those things. Um, and it's also been found that, you know, people who are suffering Alzheimer's at whatever level, um, you put a piece of music on that they grew up with and they spring to life and suddenly they'll start dancing or talking, you know. <laughs> And, and it's it's like it's like music where you're looking at that sort of principle. We had classic, two classic examples. One is the, the, the composer who uh, got a million pound donation and, and he came up with some fantastic stuff. He was struggling uh, with Alzheimer's and things like that as well. Um, and, and we also had the you disappeared briefly, Debbie, and now you're back again. And, and the other example was, was the fantastic ballerina. I don't even remember seeing the pictures of her on the news where they played, yes. she was the principal yes. ballerina in Swan Lake and they played the music and she was in a world of her own but they put the headphones on and played that piece. And she started with her arms gracefully doing the, the, the movements. It was, I mean, heartbreaking, wasn't it? Yeah. And I think the thing is, you know, when you're living on your own, like I am, it, 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 you know, you do get into your own bubble and you become this sort of weird person. Thank God I've got my dogs. They get me out every, every day. But it's, it, it will be over soon. It, it will be over soon. It, it has to be. And we just we are privileged. We, you know, we've all come up with something different. We're all doing something different. You know, we, we are I feel we are privileged to be alive. You know, we are alive. And there are a lot yes. of people who aren't who've lost their lives at yeah. this time. Absolutely. Well, uh, thank indeed. You, thank you both very much. It's an absolute delight. We will regroup either on your platform or my platform or both. We'll yeah, well, you're very, you're very, I'd love to come back and see you. You're very welcome to come up. You're very welcome to fly into the Wonderbird's nest. Uh, I would love to <laughs> visit your nest as well. And thank you for introducing to some of your animals to your menagerie. It's always a joy. Oh, I, I think, and I think you've got Dee Anderson coming on soon as well. From, oh, fantastic. From the Wonderbird. Looking forward to Dee and the many, many others. Uh, Dawn, a regular on the show. We'll see you again very, very Thank soon. you yeah, very much. And fun. thank you, Debbie, for coming on. Take thank care. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.
So thank you very much indeed to my guest, uh, Dawn, and uh, also to uh, Debbie Dawn. Wonderful, we'll be back very, very soon. And Debbie, we're going to visit her nest over at the Wonderbird. Do check it out. It's a wonderful, wonderful place. Uh, over 17 million views uh, in such a short period of time. If you would like to be a guest on the show, if you have any comments, you can write to me at guests at octopustv.com. That's guests at octopustv.com. Don't forget, you can follow me at Andrew Eborn at Octopus TV, and don't forget to subscribe on all of the usual platforms. Uh, in the meantime, thank you so much uh, for joining me today. I look forward to seeing you next time. Bye-bye.